Well, thanks for being here today. As Ashley said, if you uh, don't have a church home, we're especially welcome, but we'd love to have you return and be a part of our church. i uh, tell you a little bit about Easter next uh, Sunday. Uh, we use Easter and Christmas primarily as an opportunity to proclaim the gospel to your friends. And um, I don't know what to expect with an Easter on the end of a Christmas break. It might be smaller than normal, but on a good Easter, we'll have uh, 1,200 people in the room. So come a little bit early and uh, take all the best parking spots. You might consider parking a little further away so guests can find us. But uh, do invite your friends and neighbors, and um, we'll have a short testimony as well of someone who's come to faith in Jesus and a little bit of uh, his story. And uh, I'll, I'll try to present a little bit shorter than normal sermon with the gospel firmly embedded in it. So that's our, we rejoice obviously in the Lord's resurrection, but uh, we feel like Easter is a great opportunity to proclaim the gospel to people that attend church a couple times a year. So come join us and glad that, uh, and glad that you're with us today. We're continuing in the book of 1 Samuel if you want to turn to chapter 4. And uh, I'm going to try to cover three chapters today. I don't think I heard an audible groan. That was good. And before we do that, let me, uh, let me pray for us. Father, as we come before you this morning, I'd ask that you'd uh, speak through me, allow your spirit to do his work in the heart of each believer today. Uh, you'd help us to take a passage from thousands of years ago and understand how it applies to our hearts and lives and circumstances today. We're grateful that we have recorded in the scriptures these stories, and they're fairly, well, they're unedited. They're just truth, and they're mistakes and victories and all kinds of things wrapped into one, and we're grateful that they're here for us. And the sort of the bold rawness of the scriptures convince us yet again that they're true. You've not hidden anything, and uh, you report truth, and uh, we're grateful that we get to look into it together today. Uh, we'd ask that you'd watch over those that are traveling. Um, we're grateful that uh, vacations can be had this week, but keep people safe and bring them back safely. And we ask for Easter next week that you'd be drawing people to the church that don't yet know you, that might be curious about what it means to be a Christian or uh, just culturally feel like they need to attend church. I pray that you'd be working their hearts right now and um, that the message and the testimony, the things involved next week would be a blessing to them and draw them to yourself. Um, we ask that you comfort those that are hurting. I can think of a few that are struggling physically right now and there are other issues going on in life and uh, bring them comfort and peace and help us as a body of Christ to minister to one another and care for one another. And uh, so we're grateful that you hear us and that we can be together this morning. We come to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to look at three chapters. There's really four that go together. I might jump into chapter seven if I have an opportunity this morning. But um, it's, it's the narrative of the Ark of the Covenant. And um, you may or may not even be familiar with the, what the Ark of the Covenant was. But in Exodus chapter 25, uh, God tells Moses and gives detailed plans as to what, what the Ark should look like. And uh, basically they build a box and it's three and three quarters feet long and it's two and a quarter feet wide and it's completely covered in gold. And um, it, it, on top of it, it has a seat that's called the mercy seat that's the symbolic spot of God. And then beside each mercy seat there are two cherubims which are angel-like fig angel figures which we really don't know what they look like. And then there's some rings on the side and there's golden poles, poles that are wrapped in gold that go through the box and it's to only be carried by Levites and it's only to be transported by sort of a subset of Levites called Cherethites, I believe, Kohathites. And um, when it's covered and it's moving out, out in the open, it's, it is to be covered with some sort of linen cloth so it can't be seen um, by the average person. Um, it was led. It, it led through the Exodus and the cloud of fire and the pillar of uh, the, the pillar of fire and the cloud of cloud. Yeah, it's sort of like that thing up there. Um, you know what I'm talking about. Was over the presence of the the ark. Uh, within the ark, it contained three things: uh, the Ten Commandments, Aaron's staff, 
and a uh, jar of manna. And those things were in the ark. And it, it rested inside the tabernacle, inside the Holy of Holies. Once a year, there was an atonement, a sprinkling of blood on the mercy seat to atone for the sins of the nation. It could only be accessed and looked at by the high priest. Um, that's the Ark of the Covenant. And you maybe saw it in the Raiders of the Lost Ark movie. It melted Nazi faces off. Uh, it does do that, I'm pretty sure. So <laughs> you'll find out it, it does a lot of things you don't want it to be doing to you. So these four chapters deal with this Ark. And um, I didn't want to just skip over them. I think there's a few things we can learn. It's going to be sort of a unique opportunity for us to talk about something that uh, was so prominent in the life of Israel. Um, so let's just jump in. I'll pick it up in chapter 4. It says, And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. I would tend to put that verse in chapter 3, sort of summing up that Samuel's word is being heard, and it's being transmitted to Israel. He's now the prophet of all Israel. And then it starts, Now Israel went out to meet the Philistines in battle and camped beside Ebenezer while the Philistines camped in Aphek. The Philistines drew up in battle array to meet Israel, and when the battle spread, Israel was defeated before the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men on the battlefield. Now, the Philistines are the arch enemies of the, of the Israelites, and you'll actually see their name 150 times in the book of First and Second Samuel, so there's no escape in these Philistines. And uh, they're brutal people. It's where um, Goliath, he was a Philistine, and um, so there's a, this ongoing battle, and they battle, and they lose 4,000 men. In verse 3 it says, When the people came into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? So the Israelites are saying, You know what? We were defeated by the Philistines, but we recognize the Lord's hand is involved in this. And they ask the question, Why would God allow us to be defeated before the Philistines? And then they say this, Let's take for ourselves from Shiloh the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, that it may come, along, uh, come among us and deliver us from the power of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh, and from there they carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts, who sits above the cherubim. There's its title, by the way. That's what it's actually called. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark and the covenant of, of the Covenant of God. As the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout, so that the earth resounded. When the Philistines heard the noise and the shout, they said, What does the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews mean? And they understood that the ark of the Lord had come into the camp. And the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God has come into the camp. Woe to us, for nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us. Who shall deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods who smote the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. Take courage and be men, O Philistines, or you will become slaves to the Hebrews as they have been slaves to you. Therefore, be men and fight. So the Philistines fought and Israel was defeated. Now I'm going to stop there and we'll talk through these last nine verses. Um, Israel comes to the conclusion that they were defeated by the Philistines because of the hand of God. And rather than repenting and saying, God, what is it about us that we need to change? What... What are we doing? Why are you allowing judgment to come upon us now? Rather than thinking that thought, they do something that's, I think, is typical of many of us. They say, how can we manipulate God and bring him into the equation in such a fashion that will be undefeatable? And they say, let's bring the ark out. God would not allow for the ark to be defeated. If, if the ark is there, God is there. And he'll be fighting on our behalf, and we've sort of pushed God into a corner, and we've got him where we want him because we've got the ark and all that it represents and all of its magic and all of its power. And they really are viewing the ark like a talisman, uh, like a lucky charm, a rabbit's foot, uh, you know, a, a religious icon. They, they aren't viewing it properly. They're not viewing God properly. They're seeing this. If we can get the ark onto the battlefield doing something it was never intended to do. That's not its purpose at all. But they're just going to take it and use it for those purposes. If we can do that, then we can get God to fight our battles for us. Rather than saying, you know, God, you are worthy, and we are sinful, and you tell us what it is that we've done wrong because we want to repent of our sins, they say, God, thou art useful. 
and we want you to come solve our problem and we're going to take the ark and completely do something to it that we should not do and we're going to bring you into the equation put your name on the line so that you have to fight and defend yourself in essence and in so doing you'll defend us you ever found yourself doing that wanting to bring God into the equation because you're convinced that the direction you're going needs God's approval you maybe not prayed and asked the Lord God what is it you want from me how do you want me to approach this what do you want me to do you just bring God into the equation hoping that since you've drug him into it he's gonna have to make things work out just fine a number of years ago I was asked to be on the board of a startup company and uh, for the express purpose of it he wanted to the owner of the company wanted to do business in a godly way and he thought me being there would help the cause I was his Ark of the Covenant in essence and uh, he didn't do business in a godly way and the company failed and a lot of things failed in the midst of it and I realized somewhere along the line that I was nothing but a lucky charm for him he thought if I can get a pastor involved in my board things will go the way I want them to go well they didn't and it didn't work and we're gonna see today that this didn't work but what we also learn is that a distant relationship with God often produces a superstitious approach to life. You've probably had this thought before. Something goes wrong during the day and you go back and ask yourself, I should have read more of my Bible. Something turns out bad and you say, ah, I should have given more money at church last Sunday, which you should have done, but that's not the point. <laughs> I'm just joking. We tend to use God as a lucky rabbit's foot. And we, we wonder why when things go poorly, we come back and reassess and think of the things that we should have done. If we want a good outcome, we try to do more of the things that we think we should do to get a good outcome. And that's not how we approach God. That's not how, we're not to manipulate him. We're not to find him to be useful. We're to find him to be worthy. And they have made a drastic, huge mistake here, but it evidences the fact that their relation, the relationship with God is so, so distant, they've now really just become superstitious. And they think if we can get God and get the ark involved in this thing, there's no way the Philistines will defeat us because God's name is on the line. Another example of this is years ago, well, year, four or five years ago now, when Amanda, one of our coworkers, was suffering with cancer and eventually she passed away and was with the Lord. A lady not in our church came into the office one day and she prayed for her and she prayed a prayer that was, she claimed victory, she claimed healing, she, she pushed God into a corner, God will heal you, I'm convinced of this, don't, don't worry about it. Um, she was speaking with great power and wisdom and authority and <clears throat> in my opinion, she was trying to bring the Ark of the Covenant into play. She was trying to put God in a corner. She made these proclamations, and the only alternative was either God heals or your faith isn't big enough. I despise that kind of thing. I think we can pray for healings, but we don't push God into a corner, and we don't manipulate him, and we don't say things publicly that put God's name at risk. And that was a tough thing for Amanda because she, you know, who wouldn't want to be healed of the circumstances she was in, but that put such tension in that period of time in her life. We need to be careful. We, we need to be certain that we're not using God as a lucky charm or a rabbit's foot because the outcome is not what we want. So let's look at the outcome. Verse 10, so the Philistines fought and Israel that was defeated, and every man fled to his tent. And the slaughter was very great, for there fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers that day. And the ark of God was taken, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. Now a man of Benjamin ran from the battle line and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes torn and dust on his head. And when he came, behold, Eli was sitting on his seat by the road, eagerly watching because his heart was trembling for the ark of the God. So the man came to tell it in the city, and all the city cried out. And when Eli heard the noise of the outcry, he said, What does this noise of this commotion mean? And the man came hurriedly and told Eli. 
Now Eli was 89 years old, and his eyes were set so that he could not see. That's a fancy way of saying he's blind. And a man said to Eli, I am the one who came from the battle line. Indeed, I escaped from the battle line today. And he said, How did things go, my son? Then the one who brought news replied, Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there has also been a great slaughter among the people. And your two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God has been taken. When he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell off his seat backward beside the gate, and his neck was broken, and he died, for he was old and heavy. Thus he judged Israel forty years. Now his daughter-in-law, Phinehas' wife, was pregnant and about to give birth. And when she heard the news that the ark of God was taken, and that her father-in-law and her husband had died, she kneeled down and gave birth, for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, so she dies in childbirth, the woman who stood beside her said, Don't be afraid, for you've given birth to a son. But she did not answer or pay attention, and she called the boy Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel. Because the ark was taken and because of her father-in-law and her husband, then she said, The glory has departed from Israel, for the ark of God was taken. What an amazing turn of events here. The ark that was the glory of Israel, it represented the presence of God. It had led them throughout the exodus through the wilderness. It led them into the promised land. The ark that was the glory of Israel is now in the hands of their arch enemy. It, we'll find out in just a minute what they do with it. But the glory of Israel has departed, and this, this woman in her last moments has summed up very nicely what's taking place in the nation of Israel. They have viewed the ark as a trinket. They've not listened nor obeyed God. They've asked God to bless their foolish plans. The wickedness in their heart they choose not to repent from. And God is saying, I'm not going to put up with this. And he allows the ark to be taken, but in so doing, he accomplishes what had been prophesied in chapter 2. Remember, the prophet came to Eli and he said, your sons are going to die. And all these turns of events accomplish what God needs to accomplish in killing the sons of Eli and bringing the nation to its knees in a new and different way. Um, God is never the victim. He is always the victor. And we're going to see that he's, it, it appears like, uh-oh, God's in big trouble, the the ark has been taken. What's going to happen? God is always in control. He is never the victim. He's always the victor. And let's continue on. Now the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. And the Philistines took the ark and brought it to the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. So Dagon is their god, and there's a statue of Dagon in, in the temple. He's the god of uh, thunder and storms and fertility. And uh, so they, they've set the ark at the feet of Dagon. And this is very symbolic, as you can imagine. It's like uh, he's the God of Israel. The ark of the covenant is bowing down before the God of the Philistines, Dagon. And this is a big day for the Philistines. They routed the Israelites. They've got the ark. They've got the, the power that comes with it. Remember, they, the Philistines aren't idiots. They were like, uh-oh, what's going to happen? Because this is the God that took it to the Egyptians. They remembered the story. It's been hundreds of years later, but they remembered the story. They, they had not forgotten what kind of power the God of Israel had. And in fact, that the ark was brought forward and the Israelites chanted, that gave the Philistines a sense of resolve and they said, fight like men. Do not be taken. You'll be made slaves. And their resolve won the day. Now they own the ark Things are really looking up for the Philistines. And uh, so here's what happened. They set, they set the ark in the morning, but early, at, at verse 3, when the Ashdites arose early the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and set him in place again. Now that's, you see the irony there? We've got to set our God up. He fell over last night. 
boy, we, you know, we do that sometimes, don't we? I mean, we have this, those foolish gods, and they fail us over and over again, and we continue to set them up in their place, and we follow after money or power or something, and we think, well, this time this god won't let us down, and it always lets us down. And so they've, they've set the ark in front of Dagon, and they're thinking, this is what a beautiful picture, and Dagon falls over during the night. So they set him back up, in verse 4, but when they arose early the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. This is amazing. So God comes in at night and says, I had enough of that, and pushes Dagon over. They set him back up, and he says, no, I'm going to push him over again. This time, knocks his head and his hands off. Now, I think this is telling at two levels. One, not too many chapters from now, we're going to find out that David cuts the head of Goliath off. And this is God saying, your God is worthless, and he is dead, and he is utterly defeated. I've cut his head off, and there it is. And breaking his hands off, it, I want you to look for the word hand as we go forward, because the hand of God is very active going forward. And the hand of God is going to be heavy on the Philistines. And so we see this poetry in this picture. God is saying, your stupid, worthless idol of a God doesn't even have hands. And my hands do what I want done. And you have no control over them. And I am the God of eternity. I am the God of the universe. There is no other God. And that's the principle I would draw from this, is there is only one God, and all the rest are man-made nonsense. It doesn't matter what religion you study, what philosophy you look into, there is no value or worth in it in eternity. There, there is only one God, and everything else is worthless stone and nonsense. Sometimes we're led to believe as a, as a religion gains power. I'm, I've been watching this show on uh, Rajneesh. Is anybody else watching it? No. <laughs> it, it's it's a inter very interesting show. But as, as the Rajneeshis gain power and as things... I'm not going to tell this. Half of you don't even know who I'm talking about. No. When a false religion rises and begins to grow... We, we scratch our heads and we go, well, maybe there's something to this. And the world begins to pay attention. And it's a story like this that brings us back to reality that God says, no, there's nothing to this. I will push it over. It is worthless. It is powerless. I alone am God. So we just see this little story. It takes place at night. Nobody's watching. God does a miraculous thing in pushing over this statue, does it twice, but it reveals volumes about who he is and who the rest of the gods of the world are. They are worthless nonsense. So, uh, verse 6. Now the hand of the Lord was heavy on the Ashdodites, Ashdodites, and he ravaged them and smote them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territories. Okay, so Dagon has no hands. Here it says, and the hand of God is heavy on the Philistines. You've stolen the ark, you've taken the ark, I'm going to meet you and give you tumors. When the men of Ashdod saw that, that it was so, they said, the ark of God of Israel must not remain with us, for the hand is severe on us, on Dagod our God. Okay, they, they're figuring it out real quick. Okay, we've got this ark and it's destroyed our God, and we are terribly uncomfortable with tumors. Your Bible might call them hemorrhoids. Uh, I think what it is, my personal opinion, is the bubonic plague. Uh, one one uh, commentator this week pointed that out, that the bubonic plague comes with lots and lots of tumors, and it's spread by mice and rats and animals. And it could be just God doing whatever he wants, but it also could be the fact that God's saying, I'm going to bring the plague your direction. So they gathered together all the lords of the Philistines, verse 8, and said to them, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? And they said, Let the ark of the God of Israel be brought around to Gath. And they brought the ark around to Gath. So they're saying, Well, let's, let's take it over to Marion County. We don't want it in Lane County. Let's take it to Marion County. Give it to them. So they're selling a lemon to them. 
you know, it's, it's low miles. It's been driven every Sunday. Here it is. It's all yours. They're bringing the ark over and saying, yeah, enjoy it. It's got all kinds of power. You're going to think this is great. After they brought it around, the hand of the Lord was against uh, the city in a very, with very great confusion, and he smote the men of the city, both young and old, so that the tumors broke out on them. So they sent the, the ark of God to Ekron. These are loving people. They, they care for their brothers. Let's send it over to Ekron. And the ark of the God came to Ekron, and the Ekronites cried out, saying, hey, they brought the ark of the God of Israel around to us to kill us and our people. So word's getting out. This thing is bad news. They sent therefore and gathered all the lords of the Philistines and said, send away the ark of the God of Israel and let it return to its own place so that it will not kill us and our people. For there was a deadly confusion throughout the city. The hand of God was very heavy there. And the men who did not die were smitten with tumors and the cry of the city went up to heaven. So the Philistines are just in terrible shape. Physically, they're being killed and ravaged with tumors. They've got this ark on their hands. They can't figure out how to get rid of it. Um, they have gambled and lost big time. So verse chapter 6. Now the ark of the Lord had been in the country of the Philistines for seven months. And the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners. And they said, what shall we do with the ark of the, of the Lord? Tell us how we'll send it to its place. And they said, if you send away the ark of God of Israel, do not send it empty. But you shall surely return to him a guilt offering. And then you will be healed and it will be known to you why, why his hand is not removed from you. So they've got enough sense to say, okay, we have offended this God. Let's return the ark, but let's give an offering, a guilt offering, acknowledging we are guilty. We, we are sorry we did this. And... Uh, very unique offering. Um, it says, then, then you will be healed, and it is known why the hand is not removed from you. So the hand of God again. Verse 4. They said, what shall be the guilt offering for which we shall return to him? And they said, five golden lords of the Philistines, excuse me, five golden tumors and five golden mice, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines, for one plague was on all of you and on your lords. So <laughs> this is hilarious to me somebody has to model for these tumors and there's a goldsmith that's making tumors and making little mice and they put them in a box next to the the ark and they want to send it back and that's their offering and so that's what they do so you shall make likenesses of your tumors and likenesses of your of the mice that have ravaged the land and you shall give the glory uh, give glory to the God of Israel. Perhaps he will ease his hand from you and your God and your land. Why then do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and the Pharaohs hardened their hearts when he severely dealt with them? Did they not allow the people to go and they departed? Now therefore take and prepare a new cart and two milch cows on which there has never been a yoke and hitch the cows to the cart and take their calves home away from them. Take the ark of the Lord and place it on the cart and put the articles of gold which you would return to him as a guilt offering in the box by its side. Then send it away that it may go. Here's verse 9. This is important. Watch. If it goes by the way of its own to, to the territory of Beth Shemesh, then he has done this great evil. But if not, then we will know that it was not his hand that struck us and it happened by chance. So they're wondering, okay, we think this is God's doing. But we don't know for certain. How can we determine this? And they say, okay, build this cart. Put two cows that have two calves. So they're making this test as difficult as possible. Put two cows who have two calves. Hook them to a cart. They've never been in a yoke before. They don't know what they're doing. Put the Ark of the Covenant in the cart. Put the box full of our golden tumors and the golden mice next to the Ark of the Covenant. Send it out and see which way it goes. If it goes to Israel, then we know God's hand was against us. If it doesn't go to Israel, it's just a plague. It's just chance. Well, God's going to make himself known in this as well. So, uh, verse 10, so they, they did. They took the two milk cows and hitched them to the cart and shut their calves at home. They put the ark of the Lord on the cart and the box of the golden mice and the likeness of their tumors. And the cows took the straight way 
in the direction of Beth Shemesh. And they went along the highway lowing as they went. Now, I've not worked with cattle a lot. I worked on a small cattle farm when I was in high school. And if you had a cow and a calf, they were hard to separate. And in fact, if you had the wrong cow and you were near the calf, she didn't like that. She'd come over and give you a hard time because she didn't want you around her calf. You'd take a calf away and the calf would be bleeding and bawling and mooing and, you, and the cow would be mooing and lowing and they wanted to be together. So really what's happening here is they're saying, let's make this test as difficult as possible. Take these two animals, separate them, see what happens. The cow walks up the road to Israel and it's mooing and lowing the whole way, missing its calf. We're seeing a little miracle here, quite honestly. God's hand is still involved and he's demonstrating to them, not only do I destroy your stupid God and I break his hands off because he has no power, I will demonstrate to you that despite the way you set this up, you're going to know without a shadow of a doubt that the tumors and the plague that faces your land came from my hands and no place else. God is not going to share his glory. He's not going to be manipulated. He's going to do what he's going to do, and he's doing it in such a fashion that they get to see the truth, and now we do too. And we see that God is working in these little details to accomplish his purposes and plan. So now the people of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley, and they raised their eyes, and they saw the ark, and they were glad to see it. So these were Israelites now. They're doing their job. They look up. Here comes a couple of cows pulling a wagon and they can see the ark in it. It's shining in gold. And they're like, finally our ark is back. They've been for seven months without it, wondering what's going to happen, wondering where the presence of God is, all the things associated with this. So they rejoice that the ark is back. Um, the cart came into the field of Joash, the Beth Shemite, and stood there and there was a large stone. So they split the wood of the cart and they offered the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. The Levites took down the Ark of the Lord and the box that was with, with it, in which there were articles of gold, and put them on the large stone. And the men of the Beth, uh, Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and sacrifices that day to the Lord. When the five lords of the Philistines saw it, they returned to Ekron that day. So Philistines are divided into five counties. Each county has a lord. They tried to pawn this thing off on each other. Finally, they wised up, let's get it out of here. They walk behind this thing at a great distance to make certain it goes the right direction. When they see that Israelites have it, that they've done their sacrifices, they breathe a sigh of relief and they head back home. And um, you've got to give them enough credit at least to say they knew who they were dealing with. They recognized soon that they better not mess with him. And they did not want their hearts to be hardened the way the, Isra the Egyptians had. They said, no, let's not harden our hearts. Let's get this thing out of here. And they did. So now Israel takes it back. Now, here's, it, it gets interesting, as if it's not been. Uh, these are the golden tumors, which the Philistines returned for their guilt offering to the Lord. One for Ashdod, one for Gaza, one for Ashkelon, one for Gath, and one for Ekron. And the golden mice, according to the numbers of all the cities of the Philistines belonging to the five lords, both of which they set, set uh, the ark of the Lord by, as a witness to this day in the field of Joash, uh, Joshua the Beth Shemite. He struck down some of the men of, of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. He struck down all the people, 50,070 men, and the people mourned because the Lord had struck the people with great slaughter. And the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before the Lord, this holy God, and to whom shall we go up and to whom shall go up from us? So they sent messengers to the inhabitants of Kiriath Jerim, saying, The Philistines have brought back the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it up to you. Okay, so here, and we're just about done. I'm going to wrap this up. They've sent the ark back. It comes back to the Israelites. The Israelites do what they think to do is sacrifice, burn up that wagon, sacrifice the cows. They've got the ark back. But some of them are, are treating the ark as though it's just an interesting artifact. Um, that verse is, there's a lot of confusion about verse 19. Um, some would suggest that when it says they looked into the ark, it doesn't really say that. It, it says that they looked, at, they observed it too closely. See, they weren't even supposed to see the outside of this thing. 
Remember, in its original intention, it was only to be seen by the high priest, and if it ever came out, it was always to be covered. So either they looked into it, or they investigated around it, or there's a third option, is that, and that is that they just took it with indifference. Now, the number 50,070 men is problematic. I don't know. Uh, some versions say 70 men. Um, they Historians would say, well, the village wasn't even 50,000 and 70 men. Um, here's what I do with a problem like that. I don't worry about it. And, and this is why. Uh, we're seeing miracle after miracle here. We're seeing God's hand at work. We're seeing God do all kinds of things that demonstrate his power and his strength and his glory. Um, that there could have been a transposition of numbers in the scribal work that you know, took one passage to another doesn't bother me because God is still powerful and sovereign and he's going to get it accomplished what he wants to accomplish in our reading of the scriptures. So the principle we learn here is this. Don't mess with the Ark of the Covenant. Don't mess with God. Don't view it as a rabbit's foot. Don't peek into it if you're not supposed to. Don't ignore it, sort of with a yawn, oh, it's just the ark. God is holy. He has revealed himself to us. He's told us how to approach him. And if we approach him on any other term, disaster is to be paid. Now, what does that look like for you and for me today? God is holy. He is absolutely holy, righteous, and just. He's the only God. His hand is at work. He cannot be approached by sinful people like you and me. We can't sort of peek into him. We, we can't investigate him and come away unscathed. We can't ignore him and say, that's ah, no big deal. We can only come to God on his terms, and he's been very clear about those terms. And those terms are, I'm going to send my son, and he's going to come to the world, and he's going to live sinlessly, and he's going to walk in perfect harmony and obedience to the Father, and he's going to die on the cross and take upon himself the sins of the world so that you have access and I have access to God our Father. That is the only way we can get to God. Those are the only terms that God has ever mapped out that allow us to have a relationship with him. So to ignore those terms is to say, ah, it's just an ark, what's the big deal? To come up with other terms, to say, I don't think, let's... let's plan something different. Let's use the ark for another purpose. Let's get the ark to accomplish our purposes. Nope, can't do that either. We can only come to God through his ark, through his provision, through his son Jesus. Let me keep moving on here. <clears throat> um, wanted to note that when the ark came to the Philistines. They had two options. One was to say, okay, things are not going well for us here. Uh, this plague is killing our people. It's terrible with these tumors. We're infested by mice. We understand it's God's hand. We could repent. We've, God has given us this unbelievable opportunity. He has revealed himself to us in a way that he's never revealed himself to anybody else. We hold this ark and we recognize its connection to him. We could repent and turn, but they don't. Their solution is get rid of the ark. Push God away. Get rid of God. Today's Palm Sunday. When Jesus entered in Jerusalem, people threw down palm branches in their coats and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They had access to Jesus unlike anybody else ever has. The city rose up. They were excited to have him there. By Friday, they were killing him. Things just don't change. People had access to God. They had this insight, this view, this beautiful opportunity to repent. And they say, no, away with it. We don't want it. Get it out of here. They, they pushed God away. You and I, we have this access to God. We have this communication from him about his son, about his saving ability, his grace in our lives. 
And we can say, thank you, I repent, I, I recognize my sin, I am broken about it. You have, your hand has been heavy upon me of conviction. Thank you, I repent, I believe in Jesus. Or we say, nope, not going to do that. I'm going to push him away. Send him back where he's from. I don't want anything to do with him. I think that's the application for us today. Um, it, it, it's an amazing story showing the power in the hand of God. It, it shows that some people want to treat God like a lucky charm. Other people want to just ignore him with indifference. Things have not changed. Don't treat God like a lucky charm because he is not. He is the God of the universe. Don't ignore him because that will cost you dearly. Repent, believe, follow. Be adopted by him. I mean, what an amazing, amazing opportunity we have. Don't squander it. Come to him. Let's pray. Father, as we read this story and sort of overwhelmed with the power and the details and the things that we don't fully understand. You have a, a way you wanted this ark to be handled and all that stuff comes together and we see people trying to manipulate you and casting you out and pushing you away. And, but your purposes are always accomplished. You abandoned Israel only to return in a different fashion. You got their attention in a way that Hopefully they can understand. You, God, have never abandoned us. You are always wanting to come to us. You want us to believe in you through the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray today that you draw people to yourself to do that. I'm grateful that this story has been preserved for us so we can understand more about your holiness and your power. But help it to be not just an intellectual lesson, but a conviction of the heart that we would turn to you. Thank you that you love us, that we experience your grace, that your spirit is alive and well, and that he indwells those of us who are your believers, and that you can bring the truth of this gospel into our hearts and lives. And we come to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you stand with us?